Some say the trouble's in the Pentagon. Some say the trouble's in the street. Some say the president's a paragon. Where's the trouble at the bottom? Hi, I'm Steve Plach, and I'll be your host for this segment on human rights here now. On this program, we'll be talking about the establishment of a constitution protection zone in both the city and the county of Santa Cruz. I'm really delighted to have with me today two of the people who are in the forefront of this movement in uh, the city and county. Uh, Daniel Sheehan, Daniel, welcome. Uh, Daniel is legal counsel for the Romero Institute. And Sarah Nelson, executive director of the Romero Institute. Formerly, I would hasten to say, the Christic Institute, so that's what people know. Uh, Daniel, let's start with you. Um, Certainly people in uh, Santa Cruz are familiar with your national reputation as an advocate and as legal counsel, uh, most notably with the Lakota People's Law Project and recently with the Ohlone Elders, which you yes. were good enough to champion in their, um, uh, their recent uh, uh, ancestral burial grounds dispute with uh, the developers. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your background just so that people can familiarize yourself with, the, with you. Actually, I uh, spent, we spent uh, almost 20 years in Washington, D.C., mm. uh, Sarah and I, uh, directing the Christic Institute, which is a major 501c3 public interest law firm and in, uh, in, in organizing organization that really tended to represent the 54 major religious denominations in the country. Mm -hmm. Their social ministry offices that prior to that time, Sarah, who was our executive director, was the National Labor Secretary for the National Organization for Women oh. in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. I was Chief Counsel for the Jesuit National Headquarters. Uh, I had uh, graduated from Harvard Law School and was the co-founder of the Harvard Civil Rights Law Review uh, and went on to uh, Wall Street and uh, practiced at the Cahill firm, the number one corporate litigation law firm. Mm -hmm. We represented the New York Times in the Pentagon Papers case. We actually prepared the briefs and argued in the, in the court all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, to allow the New York Times to publish the 47 volumes of the Pentagon Papers. Uh, I actually initiated the litigation that established the right of journalists to protect their confidential news sources. Uh, and so I spent that time there, then went to F. Lee Bailey's office and ah. was uh, legal counsel and uh, our office represented James McCord in the Watergate burglary oh, really? case. And he's mm -hmm. the guy that blew the whistle of on course, Richard yeah. Nixon, wrote the mm -hmm. letter to Judge yeah. Sirica blowing the whistle on mm -hmm. them. And, then I became, I went back to Divinity School, Harvard Divinity School, and uh, then went on to become Chief Counsel for the United States Jesuit Headquarters. And Wonderful. that's where Sarah and I worked together on the Silkwood case. Mm -hmm. Sarah, oh, had, Sarah initiated okay. the Karen Silkwood right. case and came and uh, brought me on as mm -hmm. legal counsel. Uh, and we did that case. We did the Three Mile Island litigation mm -hmm. uh, in Pennsylvania. We did the prosecution, the civil rights prosecution against the Ku Klux Klan. Mm -hmm the American Nazi Party down in Greensboro, North Carolina. And we did the American Sanctuary Movement uh, ah, cases okay. down in Texas mm -hmm. uh, that uh, declared unconstitutional the uh, refusal to enforce the, uh, the, the act that gives refugee status mm -hmm. to bona fide refugees. And uh, we did the major Iran-Contra case. Okay. We're the ones that uh, initiated the Iran-Contra mm -hmm. case and pushed and forced to get the special prosecutor brought on board. Uh, so th those are the things that we've done in Washington, D.C. Yeah. Uh, and then we came to California and have been here since then mm -hmm. and uh, have, have been working for the State of the World Forum. Mm -hmm. Sarah was the executive director for the Gorbachev uh, Foundation and the, the, uh, the State of the World Forum that was co-founded by Gorbachev and former American Secretary of State James Baker, bringing in yeah. world presidents mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the Cold War uh, trying to work with presidents and secretaries of state and secretaries of defense and the heads of the major corporations around the world to try to establish some new paradigm uh, prior to the bad guys figuring out some other right. bad guys yeah, exactly. uh, to, yeah, yeah. to make a new Cold War. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that's that been our background. Yeah. And we've, we, we moved to Santa Cruz. Our, our younger son uh, was going to University of Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so we came here and have established the Romero Institute here and have become involved in a number of uh, issues locally, uh, as well as the work we're doing for the Lakota yeah. up in South Dakota. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, Sarah was one of the major people yeah. working uh, to stop yeah. the, the spraying of the, mm -hmm. the moth, brown moth yeah. here. So we've been active yeah. in this, but this issue of the 
the passage of the National Defense Authorization and Act. And we'll get to that. Is uh, scary. Yeah, absolutely. And so no this, this is a it. huge yeah. thing uh, for our, yeah. our community. Yeah. And Santa Cruz is certainly fortunate to have a man of your ability and your experience, uh, not only here working with us, but also through the Romero Institute. So uh, we appreciate uh, all that you are contributing to these uh, very important issues. Sarah, give us a little bit about your background, your executive director of the Romero Institute, as Danny mentioned, with the Christic Institute formally. Just tell us a bit about yourself. Um, well, I think pr uh, our work together really began with the Karen Silkwood case. And um, I had worked in Santa Cruz earlier in community access television productions, which preceded oh, is that right? this. Yes, uh -huh. we, we were working with the <laughs> well, cable uh -huh. cable station, and we were making we were doing news three nights a week, and also uh, nine programs on seniors, nine programs on women. Mm -hmm. This was in the early '70s, and um, and then it was really one of those programs. Uh, it was a, a woman from from Santa Cruz. Uh, paid for me to go to Chicago to the Coalition of Labor Union Women's first meeting that they ever had, where they were going to talk about their needs and problems as women inside of labor unions, and um, and it was of course during the you know really a lot of organizing in the feminist movement, and this was just the first time that the labor union women had really come forward as a group, and so it was a very big deal. And um, so um, she sent me to Chicago, and I put, took a camera, and, <laughs> you know, and they were big, heavy uh -huh. things. I, used to, I was lifting weights for three months before I went so oh I could goodness. carry everything. Uh -huh. and, um, and I shot the conference and did capture the spirit of the whole thing. They thought they were going to have you know, 1,200 people. They had 3,400 people. I'm it goodness. was just, yeah. just people came out of the mm -hmm. woodwork. It was very, very, and they formed the Coalition of Labor Union Women. I took that that video which we and I was trying to raise money to convert it to a film because at that time in the early 70s not everyone had video machines mm -hmm. it was course, yeah. it was still film and so we we wanted to make an organizing tool for for women in the labor movement mm -hmm. and through that process and I won't go into all the details but through that process <laughs> Uh, we showed we showed that video up and down the East Coast, and in, including to the National Organization mm -hmm. for Women, uh, their national offices on the East Coast. And a letter came in the mail asking if I would become the the labor chair for for now. Mm -hmm. And I I knew that it was something. I was kind of like jumping off a cliff. Of course, yeah. I, So, but I felt. I could tell this was something that was very important to do. So I did, and we were working on, I don't know, we had a big committee and we were working on a number of different issues when about seven months into it, a woman fr came and said, you know, I have a lot of information on someone called Karen Silkwood and I want to give it to you because she was a union woman mm -hmm. and she's dead and I believe she was murdered and, and it's a cover up and unless, unless we all do something mm -hmm. about it, nothing's going to happen. And that was the beginning of what became a very big case. Of course, case. yes. Yeah. And what's important, I think, about that in relation to what we need to do in Santa Cruz mm -hmm. is that that, that was the beginning of our working with large constituencies. We had seven constituencies working on Silkwood, mm -hmm. national constituencies. Um, the ACLU mm -hmm. in, in terms of, because there were civil liberties violations, of course. the Environmental Policy mm -hmm. Institute, the whole anti-nuclear movement, the National Organization for Women, the Oil Chemical and Atomic mm -hmm. Workers Union, there were, there were all these national constituencies working together and, and that ever since then we try to do that with any of the major projects mm -hmm. and the constituencies may change depending on what the issues are that are in in one of these projects. Um, so in this particular case, in, the, in this issue of we need a constitutional protection zone in our county, in our city, one of the constituencies that's really important are attorneys. Of course. Because yeah. this, this is a legal mm -hmm. issue, a constitutional question. Yeah. This is the kind of thing that attorneys need to lead the way and mm -hmm. help people understand and, and articulate why why we have to take action. Yeah. And um, uh, I think churches are another very, of very course, important yeah. constituency because, because the Constitution is, uh, is inspired mm -hmm. in this country. It, it, we're talking about inalienable rights, which you have simply because you're born human. Where do they come from? They aren't given to us by ourselves. 
we are born with them. So there's a there's a very sort of spiritual aspect mm -hmm. to the, the 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 constitution in this country and its sort of inspired right. uh, life in, here and in other places. Of course, we know it wasn't perfect, yeah. and we've had to add more constituencies, and we need to keep adding constituencies. But but um, but the it was a beautiful idea. It was a real gift that we have to offer the world amidst some of our other things and that we we'll may see, not be so proud yeah, of. See what we can do to preserve that. Uh, no wonder you're so comfortable here on the set as a CTV uh, community television veteran. Um, you know, I had the great pleasure of working with the Romero Institute folks and yourselves uh, during this, uh, uh, the Chris Hedges event, where you brought Christopher Hedges, you brought Christopher Hedges to town, he was talking about defending our civil liberties, and really uh, became a platform and a jumping off point for what we're about to discuss, and that is the establishment of the Constitutional Protection Zone. But let's go back uh, a little bit into the history, and Danny, you can help us with this. Um, the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization yeah. Act, and this is uh, the kind of the bedrock uh, 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 threat, really, that we're facing, that's right. uh, on which I think the Constitutional Protection Zone really finds some life. And, and that's, right. Yeah. that's right. Well, what, what happened is, uh, obviously, after 9-11, <clears throat> with the passage of the Patriot Act and the other uh, kind of rather draconian measures that were taken by the W. Bush administration and Dick Cheney, mm -hmm. specifically, uh, they began to move a lot of these uh, these statutes into place, but they began a whole series of executive orders, secret executive orders that were being put in place to authorize renditioning people, mm -hmm. picking people up with no probable cause, torturing them, mm -hmm. etc. Uh, and and the, there were a whole series of these these secret uh, executive orders. And what happened is that John Yu, one of the lawyers that worked with Cheney, mm -hmm. uh, in that case with David Addington, they began to make arguments that if these secret policies were being followed by the executive branch and they were notifying Congress confidentially that these were going on, mm -hmm. that, that was, uh, they, they were acquiescing, mm -hmm. that Congress was acquiescing to what it is they were doing. Uh, and so they, they continued to make that argument throughout their entire administration. And when people started finding out about these things, the American Civil Liberties Union being one of the leading mm -hmm. groups, uh, and, and I, I did all the litigation for the American Civil Liberties Union for oh, 10 wonderful. states. Well, thank you on behalf of the ACLU. Yeah. You know, I'm vice yeah. chair of the Santa Cruz County ACLU, so yeah. we appreciate so, so, your efforts. So yeah. the ACLU was one of the leading people on this, and so a lot of us started looking to ACLU to kind of help bring forth what the challenges were to these things. Mm -hmm. And ACLU began to find out about these secret programs started trying to challenge them in, in courts. Mm -hmm. uh, and what, what happened is that, that the, the progressive elements and liberal elements in the Democratic Party started mobilizing to try to oppose these things. And that's why Obama, when he was running for the, the, presi the presidential nomination, and John Edwards, too, mm -hmm. uh, began to talk about these things mm -hmm. and to began to challenge these things, saying that if they were elected, uh, that they would stop these, these things. Mm -hmm. And what happened is, uh, is Obama came to office uh, based on a lot of his opposition to these things that had been challenged. But what, what happened is once he, once he got into office, he was surrounded by these national security state types, mm -hmm. uh, and he began to uh, acquiesce to the continuation of these things. So there was a, a movement that was begun in Congress through some of the, the, the Progressive Caucus, for example, mm -hmm. to try to raise potential uh, legislation to challenge some of these things. And what happened is the right-wing elements in the Republican Party uh, mirror to that, said, look, at, let's try to get these codified. Mm -hmm. Let's try to get these specifically authorized by legislation uh, and so that we can basically push back against the liberals in the Democratic Party uh, and challenge them for being soft on terrorism. And what happened is this sort of came to the fore here uh, in, in 2011, uh, what, what happened is the extreme right-wing elements in the House of Representatives uh, proposed uh, a, a couple of uh, insertions into the big, huge, omnibus right. military authorization mm -hmm. bill. They said, look it, uh, if we can slip these into the military authorization bill, anybody who votes against it right. is going to look like they're soft on supporting the military. Right. And the, the liberals in the Democratic Party are very sensitive about that. So they, they devised this tactic. And uh, the, those of us in the ACLU started talking about, look, the, this is that extreme right-wing element. Uh, 
it's not likely that the, the general people in the Republican Party, the mere conservatives and moderates, are going to go along with this. But what happened is because of the coercive power of that extreme right-wing element within the Republican Party, they first, they first uh, cowed the conservatives, and then they cowed the moderates, and so they ended up kind of as a block supporting, inserting into this National Defense Authorization Bill as of April of, of 2011, these provisions, uh, section 1021 right. and section yep. 1022. Mm -hmm. And these particular provisions were attempting to codify a series of secret procedures that had been going on in the W. Bush administration, the renditioning, mm -hmm. that is and sweeping people. And people uh, who may not understand right. renditioning. Re renditioning is, is, is sweeping, a sweeping a person off the streets right. uh, without any probable cause to believe that they've committed any specific crime. Mm -hmm. It's prospective uh, law enforcement right. thinking, oh, well, this person's a potential threat. Mm -hmm. They may be engaged in something. And what they would do is they would scoop them up and they'd say, well, because they haven't committed any crime yet, we certainly can't arraign them because we can't show there's any probable cause to believe they've committed a crime. <laughs> Conveniently so, dispenses with that requirement. It's a, <laughs> dispenses with that. And, 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 and of course, we, the, the issue doesn't come up about whether they're going to have legal counsel mm -hmm. uh, because they're not going to be charged with any crime. So exactly. why would they need legal right. counsel? And so that they had a whole series of these private practices. And so what they decided they were going to do is they were going to codify these in section 1021. Mm -hmm. And what they were going to do is they were going to authorize the United States military to, to sweep a, a person off the street, mm -hmm. even without any probable cause to, that they committed a crime. And so they had to articulate some standard for what would operate under the statute. So they said, any, of course, they lead up with, of course, any person who has been directly shown to be engaged in military combat against the United States and responsible for attacking us on 9-11. Of course, everybody goes, well, certainly. Yes, well, certainly, certainly yeah. them. And, and then they said, well, okay, but in addition to that, mm -hmm. we want to have anybody who is a member of the organization right. of the people that went and did this. Uh, and then thirdly, we'd like to have anybody included who gave any kind of support. The supporters, and I noticed it, that that is part of that's the That's right. Yeah, so, yeah. so they kept building larger and larger concentric right. circles right, around exactly. this core of terrorists mm -hmm. uh, and kept expanding out the statute until they, they put in the statute saying, look, it, they wanted to authorize the military to sweep anyone off the street and rendition them and put them in, in prison mm -hmm. and hold them indefinitely right. with no right to counsel, no right to a trial, no right to any kind of habeas corpus, which means I insist upon being brought in front of a judge, of course, an yes, independent indeed. judge, yeah. and have you put up your evidence to show what probable cause you have to believe that I've committed any crime. And I recall which is, that from law school, so thank which, you for which, the which, refresher course. Which, which is right <laughs> uh -huh. in the Constitution. Yeah. I mean, it says this is, a, this is a critical, yeah. fundamental right of American yeah. citizens. And so that they said, look, let's just dispense with that and see if we can get away with it. And so they put this up into the, into the statute under Section uh, 1021. Mm -hmm. And then they said, a very tricky thing that they did, they said this applies to everybody. Okay, this will, this will apply to anybody, which would include American citizens, right? right? And then they had, a, in Section 1022, they said, look, we're going to put in a provision here that says if anyone is caught directly engaged in military combat mm -hmm. against the United States, they absolutely have to be incarcerated in a military detention facility mm -hmm. as distinct from a federal prison anywhere. And because in a military, uh, military facility, they can be tortured. They can be uh, subjected to enhanced interrogation techniques and waterboarded mm -hmm. and sleep deprived and, and put into these, these painful positions and locked in cages mm -hmm. and put in tomb, at least yeah. in tomb boxes. And under the jurisdiction you know. of military law rather than civil law. That's right. In fact, and so they, that's exactly right. Yeah. And so that's so in section 1022 they said look at anybody caught in direct military combat against the United States has to be detained in a military facility mm -hmm. where they have access to these kind of procedures against them and they put in that one they said of course the mandatory requirement that they be incarcerated in a in a federal a federal military facility doesn't apply to Americans hmm. that's what they said which means that they can be held in a military detention facility, but they don't have to be. Right. Everybody else has to be. And so the, it, it introduced this great deal of confusion mm -hmm. uh, in some people's minds. Uh, if, if, the, if Section 1022 specifically says that it doesn't necessarily apply to Americans, well, then that must apply to Section 10212, so that, so that they don't have to. Uh, they don't have. But the fact of the matter is, uh, Dianne Feinstein, our United States Senator, one of our two, mm -hmm. said, wait a second. Uh, it appears to me that Section 1021 that authorizes the sweeping you off the streets and incarcerating you, regardless of what, what kind of facility you're going to be kept in, 
Uh, it at least authorizes you to be held in a military stockade, uh, and this appears to apply to Americans. Uh, and I want to put in an amendment similar to what's in 1022. I want that in 1021 say, this doesn't apply to Americans. And uh, Lindsey Graham stood up on the floor of the Senate from South Carolina and said, it absolutely does apply to Americans. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you want it to apply to Americans if they're engaged in military combat right. against them or, in fact, giving support to them or support any, have done anything to support some affiliated organization uh, that was engaged in hostilities against any ally right. of ours? It just, these these mm -hmm. concentric yeah. circles just kept getting right. bigger and bigger. And so the fact is, her amendment to try to explicitly have it not apply to Americans mm -hmm. was defeated. Right. And so it's clear that it applies to Americans. And so, but, so what happened is the right wing puts it into the, into the bill. The, the moderates and the, the conservatives first and the Republican Party fold. Then the moderates fold. And then what happens is they, they confront the Democrats. Uh, in the House of Representatives, and they said, look, well, we're going to put this bill up there, and you Democrats, if you're going to be soft on terrorism, you know, we're going to go after you, and we're going to tell all your constituents about this. Right. So this the, is the problem. Yeah. So the moderates, first the blue dogs uh, in the Democratic Party, say, okay, look, 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 I've got, I've got a lot of fairly conservative people in my state, so I'll support this too, mm -hmm. because, you know, basically it isn't going to pass anyhow, because I know that my, my, my liberal uh, brethren and sisters in the, are going to vote against it. So what happens is the blue dogs supported it, uh, and then all of a sudden the, the liberals were the ones confronted mm -hmm. by the, the challenge. And so the liberals started a cave saying, look, we'll, we'll, we'll pass this in the House. We'll pass this in the House. In the Senate, which is under the control of the Democrats, you know, they, they, they'll figure out a procedural way not to take this thing up. Uh, and so that the House of Representatives passes it in April of 2011, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so in May, it comes before the Senate. And what happens is now the Senate is confronted with this, and you have this whole group of blue dogs in the Senate. Uh, all of those people that were elected on the coattails of Obama back right. in 2008, mm -hmm. right? They know they've got elections coming up, all right? And uh, so, that, so they end up saying, look, at, we're going to support this, but we're going to rely upon the liberals in the, in, the, in the Senate to threaten to filibuster this unless these two provisions are taken out of here. Nobody would do that. Okay, so they ended up, then they started relying upon, uh, relying upon Obama to veto it. Hmm. And so, and here we are in the ACLU, we're all talking about, well, when, when, when are we going to mobilize? When are we, you know, and, and so we started feeling like in Germany, you know, well, look at, you know, they came for the Jews and I wasn't a Jew, you know, they came for the, right. you know, the labor union people and I wasn't a labor, or, you know, and so, so the, finally they started mobilizing, trying to get Obama to veto this thing. And Obama takes it with him to Hawaii on vacation back in December of 2011, right, yeah. and he signs it mm -hmm. at 11.30 p.m. on New Year's Eve. Eastern time. Eastern time. And so, that you know, it, right just as the ball is falling and everybody's dancing around in Times Square, he, you know, s signs this mm -hmm. thing into law so that it gets no ink at all mm -hmm. at the time. And so, so and what, what happens... what does he say? So, so but, but he says that, look... Uh, I'm very troubled by the fact that this section 1021 that allows you to sweep someone off the streets and incarcerate them, right. including when he in prison. It, he, he, says, he, he has a signing statement saying, look, at, I want to make it clear that at least I am not going to apply this against Americans, right. thereby making it perfectly clear that the statutory language covers American right, citizens. And, but he says, look, I'm, I'm a good guy. You can trust me. I'm not going to do this. But, of course, we're all saying, wait a second, what about Reagan? What about, what about uh, Dick Cheney? What about mm -hmm. W. Bush? Yeah. You know, that we know all these guys. What about what, what, you know, Ronald Reagan? You yeah, know? Once it becomes federal law, then it's subject to the interpretation of any subsequent administration. Well, but, 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 yeah, but not only that, but, but they knew that it applied to Americans. Right. It wasn't even a matter of them yeah. sort of arbitrarily interpreting it that way. It was now clear on the basis of the legislative history with, with uh, Feinstein's uh, proposed amendment and the signing statement that was made by Obama. It's perfectly clear that it applies to Americans. And so he just said he wasn't going to apply it against Americans. And there it was in front of us. I mean, so, it was very disappointing to me yeah. because he's a constitutional attorney, yeah. of course. Yeah. He know he has to know. He, he, he knew perfectly well what the, the implications of this were. I mean, I voted work. for him twice, yeah. but he has to have known. So, you know, and, and, and you certainly, Sarah, are just as alarmed as Danny about uh, the erosion of the liberties that really uh, presents itself through 1021, 1022. Give us your kind of observations well, about that. I mean, I, 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 I want to say I don't want to sound rash, because for some <laughs> people who haven't thought about this yet, it may sound a little rash, but it's very clear to me that the comparison with Germany is not 
is not overstepping. It's not inapt, as it's, we say? No, it's not. Yeah. Be because what happened in Germany, it, f first of all, we have a very, very active and aggressive right wing right now in our mm -hmm. country no that, it, that has positions of power now. In, in, that has been, you know, doing amazing things to our House of Representatives for the last X number of years. Mm -hmm. And um, it, w those of us who have been paying attention carefully to what is going on, the rise of this extreme right element mm -hmm. and the way that it boldly manipulates other sort of worldviews, whether it's the liberals or the moderates or the conservatives, always calling itself conservative, wanting people to think that they are conservatives, but they're actually something different. Mm -hmm. They're extreme right. And that same element was going on in Germany. And it's very bold, and people tend not to think like that themselves, and so they, they don't really expect certain things to happen, but mm -hmm. they do. And, and in fact, by the time Hitler took power, all the laws had been laid in, and he was p able to pretty much legally do whatever he wanted. And what I'm saying is we're you know, ringing the bell right now because this particular passage of this, these two uh, sections mm -hmm. is a wake-up call. We have to wake up because this is the kind of stuff that gets laid in mm -hmm. and if people don't do something about it, you find five years, ten years from now, you're going to have all kinds of people in jail, disappearing, no, no, no uh, attorneys, no, no, not even being told what they're accused of, just disappearing into and, a legal... And, and worse, worse yet is that, you know, that, that almost immediately the American Civil Liberties Union brought on a legal case in New York uh, representing Chris Hedges, Chris Hedges and, and Dan that. Ellsberg mm -hmm. and, uh, and Noam Chomsky and a number of others that are, are pretty ardent critics mm -hmm. of American foreign policy. And they brought on a major litigation saying, look it, uh, we have reason to believe that this could be enforced against us right. because these, these provisions that are put inside Section 1021 that have these growing concentric circles mm -hmm. that start out with terrorists that are attacking us, yeah, right, then the organizations of which they're just simply members, yeah. then anybody who supports those particular people, then anybody who supports uh, any one of an affiliated mm -hmm. organization of them, right. and if they, if, and anybody who supports any group that in fact is engaged in hostilities against any ally of ours, such as, for example, Israel, mm -hmm. or uh, others, that, uh, that anybody who lends support to any one of those type of organizations uh, it's this huge, expansive group of people. So they brought on the litigation And saying, Christopher Hedges is a named plaintiff? In yeah, that? He's, he's a named plaintiff in that, yeah. and that is as Dan Ellsberg and as uh, Noam, Noam Chomsky Noam. and the others. And, and Just so our viewers, if they have an interest in that, they want to go back and look at the, 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 the precursor events, really, that yes. led us to where we are now, that would be something that very illuminating. H Hedges, Hedges versus Obama. Okay, there you, you can go. Just, just Google it. Just well, that's go. easy enough to remember. Hedges, right. Hedges <laughs> versus Obama. Okay, so please. And, and, and what, what happened is, uh, is uh, Judge, Judge uh, Forrest, uh, an Obama appointee mm -hmm. to the federal court in New York, uh, she says to the Justice Department, say, look it, uh, these people are saying that as journalists that interview people around the world that are critical of American policy, even perhaps interviewing people in the Taliban mm -hmm. or interviewing people in Al-Qaeda or interviewing other radical Islamists, for example, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, they're concerned that you're going to interpret this broad language of giving support to any group that's affiliated with anybody who is engaged in hostilities against the United States or any ally could possibly apply to them. Right. So they've come here asking for a declaratory judgment, declaring it to be unconstitutional mm -hmm. as, appo as applied to them, and that it's unconstitutionally overbroad and vague. In terms <clears> and, with which I am ultimately familiar, so I know. Yeah. And, and so, so what she said to turn to the Justice Department, the U.S. Attorney in, in New York, she said, just tell us on the record that this language doesn't apply to them, mm -hmm. just for simple doing journalist activities. And the U.S. Attorney said, no, I, I'm not going to say that. There you have I'm not going to say right that there. this doesn't apply to them. Mm -hmm. and, and so that, so if, in fact, they were going to take the position that it doesn't apply to Americans, they could have said it just like that. They wouldn't. Uh, but the fact is they were insisting upon retaining the right to enforce it not only against Americans, but against American journalists against people who are engaged in, in simply interviewing anybody, yeah. anybody who's opposed to their policies. Mm -hmm. And when and as soon as the uh, as soon as the US attorney took that position, uh, Judge uh, Judge Forrest declared it mm -hmm. to be unconstitutional. She and, said, Okay, that's and, it. 
it's so, so we said, fine, uh, it's unconstitutional. But the, the Justice Department, the Obama Justice Department, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, Holder Justice Department, right. immediately, Holder. Ap yeah. immediately applied yeah. to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals and, tr and tried to get it reversed. Mm -hmm. And they took this narrow technical position of saying, look it, that these people have not proven that they've engaged in any conduct which is going to get them picked right up immediately. Mm -hmm. They're not in a clear and present immediate danger right. of being picked yeah. up uh, unless they represent more details of what they're going to be doing. Uh, and so therefore, they shouldn't be granted standing oh. to challenge this entire oh. statute. Right. Uh, they should be just technically denied standing. Mm -hmm. uh, so don't rule on the constitutionality of this. Just say that these particular people don't have standing to object to it because they haven't shown that they're in the immediate jeopardy. Right. The, 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 somebody should have yeah. said to the Court of Appeals, well, who's going to be able to show that they're going to get arrested once they've been arrested? <laughs> they've been arrested. Because they don't have any right to talk to anybody. Right. And they can't right. make any phone calls. They don't have any lawyers. There's no habeas corpus. So There's they no can't habeas be brought corpus. before a court. Yeah. So, so that, but they're, they're, they're caught in this catch-22 right. that, that you can't get standing until you've actually been picked up. Right, exactly. And, and yeah. once you're picked up, Precisely. you can't contact yeah. anybody. Precisely. And so the Second yeah. Circuit Court of Appeals said, you know, basically let this cup pass away. Mm -hmm. We don't want to. We don't want to say it's unconstitutional. So they just backed up and said that there was no standing. So now, what what happened <clears throat> is the Santa Cruz City Council mm -hmm. was the first one in the country to respond by saying we're passing a resolution that Don Lane uh, introduced it uh, along with uh, Ryan Coonerty. Yeah, w w with Ryan Coonerty. And uh, they, they introduced a, a resolution in our city council mm -hmm. saying that it's our position that this is unconstitutional and that it sh there should be a policy that it's not going to be enforced mm -hmm. uh, here. Uh, that's what they said. And that we'd like to have our, our, uh, our council contact our congressperson, uh, mm -hmm. Sam Farr, and tell him that we have a policy that we don't want this enforced mm -hmm. here. Good. But what happened after that is the state assembly the, the California that, State yeah, Assembly yeah. <clears throat> passed uh, passed uh, Assembly Bill 351. Mm -hmm. they, they passed this in, in uh, February of 2013, mm -hmm. <clears throat> almost a full year later, after our city council right. had taken the lead on this, right? And the, the, the State Assembly passed, uh, passed a bill by 71 to 1, mm -hmm. <laughs> in which they yeah. declared not only <clears throat> that this this section 10, 1021 and 1022 mm -hmm. was completely unconstitutional, but that it was not to be enforced in California. And in fact, if any federal official came into our state to try to enforce either one of those mm -hmm. provisions, they would be guilty of a crime and could be arrested by state law enforcement mm -hmm. officials and put in jail for trying to do it. And if any, any state official, law enforcement officer, or any other official in the state of California participated in any way whatsoever in assisting in enforcing this against anyone, <clears throat> they also were guilty of a crime and would be put in jail. Okay, and, and then they listed all of the different provisions of the United States Constitution that were violated by these, statu by these two statutes. And so, so that's what they did, and they passed it 71 to 1. Mm -hmm. So anybody who's looking for political cover right. on this, for example, in our city council, yeah. Or in our, our our board of supervisors, they say, look at the state assembly, seventy one. But it was, but it was yeah. passed. Yeah. But it, but but it, when the Senate got it in mm -hmm. the state, they took out one section, they let all of the rest of it go, and they did something much m m much softer. They just declared that it would be a policy. Okay. It's the policy of the government of the state of California that this not be enforced, okay. and that no one was. They said that no law enforcement officer or other official should participate in any way and that will be the policy. The problem is the problem. that there was no enforceability of it. Right. That's It's always problem. about enforcement of legislation is one of the most important aspects of it. And Absolutely. I want to make sure uh, that uh, people understand where they can go to get as much information as they would like about as we go into our conversation about the Constitution Protection Zone itself, uh, SantaCruzCPZ.org, that's SantaCruzCPZ.org, and yes. of course yes. your own RomeroInstitute.org websites okay. are, uh, have abundant information about this. And, and a couple of things that occurred to me as we're talking, one is Sarah's mentioning uh, the, uh, the kind of retrogressive reactionary state of our House of Representatives, which is about to expand itself 
itself into our Senate because right. now yes. they're going to have a Senate right. majority doing the same thing. And secondarily, uh, um, it troubles me that people are so uh, woefully uninformed about this particular issue. If you talk to them about the NDAA, you talk to them about uh, sections 1021, 1022, they just don't seem to understand any of this. And I think maybe that's one of the things that uh, a campaign for a constitutional protection zone can do that's right. is right. to educate people, not only protect their rights, as we have talked about uh, before, I am the vice chair of uh, the ACU in Santa Cruz County, and we are concerned with the erosion, generally speaking, on the larger stage of yeah. civil right. liberties in, in, right. in not only the nation, but also locally, because you can see that happening. That's right. And so as we move forward, as you move forward in uh, passing a resolution in the city and the county for a constitutional protection zone. And let's hope that the present city council can take the same principal stand that they did with Ryan Coonerty and Don Lane that's right. you know, during their era, but that's what you would be asking them to do. So talk a little bit about uh, that campaign and kind of how you're moving forward with that. Okay. That the, the, the main focus of this is to, to we, we would like to speak to the Bar Association, mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, the County Bar Association, to mobilize the lawyers, mm -hmm. because the lawyers are the ones that people look to <clears throat> to try to understand these technicalities. Right. That, and it's very clear that the lawyers in the Congress who drafted these particular bills mm -hmm. were attempting to deceive the people. They, they slipped it into this huge omnibus bill mm -hmm. of funding the entire military, mm -hmm. and they just slipped it in, authorizing the military to go ahead and, and, and detain these people. And they also... Interesting parallel, by the way, to the local legislation that the yes. uh, city council attempted to, 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 you know, to slip through uh -huh. the purchase of what is actually an urban assault vehicle, but yes. I, I digress, but let me... Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. And also very similar to what's happening here on the national level uh, that we just saw the, when this is aired last month, mm -hmm. is that, that the Republicans have tried to slip into the omnibus funding bill for right. the entire federal government. Yeah. Here, let's reverse some of the restrictions that have been put on banks mm -hmm. uh, that were put on in, in the wake of the 2008, right. you know, financial crisis. Let's let them get back into selling, you know, a credit defa default yeah. uh, swap. Well, and their high-risk investments are now going to be government guaranteed. That's right. right. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> they're not spending so, risk in their own money. So, they're risking so, so that's what they're trying. So, yeah. And it's anyway, the same exact please. tactics. Yeah. Been, so that. The first thing we want to do is reach out to the lawyers. Mm -hmm. We want to talk with the lawyers in the, in the County Bar Association to get a, a, a critical mass of our lawyers organized so that we can then, in fact, start holding meetings so that the lawyers can hold meetings among their neighbors and friends to get each of the of local course, areas yeah. where each of the city council people have mm -hmm. homes mm -hmm. to move in there to conscientize them. Because with the, 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 we, we know that we shouldn't try to attack this as a vanguard a change in the law. There has to be the grassroots people. Right. We have to all become familiar with what it is that's really going on here. And so that we want to get the lawyers brought on first. Then we want to have town, little town meetings mm -hmm. where the lawyers are all going around organizing and mm -hmm. telling the people that there's a serious danger. This is the Paul Revere movement. Right. We need to have Paul Revere saying, look at the, 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 the fascists are coming. The fascists mm -hmm. are coming. Right. You know, <clears throat> that's, that's what we want, to, we want to do. And we want to start mobilizing. We want to start getting individual people on the city council and individual people on the board of supervisors Indeed, who yes. are going to be willing yeah. to sponsor this, mm -hmm. to bring this before them, and so that they know that we're coming, that we're not going to leap right on them and try mm -hmm. to make them lead the whole community on this and, and run the risk of being attacked for being soft on terrorism yeah. and all that. We're going to work through the grassroots, and we're going to talk to different citizens groups. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll get the first the lawyers, then what we're going to do is we'll start getting the educators. Mm -hmm. We're going to start going churches. to the schools. We're going to go to the churches. Yeah. This is a grassroots campaign of course. Yeah. <clears throat> to mobilize our people because our people have to be the ones that are, we're the ones that are at risk here. Mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 they're not going to sweep in and, and take our city council right. members and put them in prison. They're going to come and take our right. people. <clears throat> you know, and they're going to be the organizers. And, the, and, it, and, and of course, in addition to yourself, uh, there are local attorneys who are outstanding in this area. Ben Rice, for instance, right. Gary mm -hmm. Patton, for instance. Those people really could be touchstones and leaders in that's this right. kind of uh, an effort. As Sarah, in our last uh, debrief meeting after the Chris Hedges event, which was wonderful, by the way, standing room only at Interlight Ministries. Uh, Danny, excellent introductions and uh, talking yourself. And Sarah, uh, Chris was, uh, was just extraordinary, in fact. Um, we were talking talking about the ways in which you can bring networks together in order to really support right. you know, the resolutions in the Constitutional Protection Zone initiative. Yes, we, the, uh, it was wonderful, the, the event at Interlight Ministries. Just, it was so wonderful. It was, 
uh, the whole place was there were about 600 people there yeah. and and uh, you know he, of course he's of very inspiring yeah. speaker very inspiring and um, the, a lot of people organized to make that a success uh, food not bombs and and a number of other constituencies who were sponsors ACLU I would say ACLU <laughs> right and uh, lots of good yeah. people and one of the one of the reasons that we got involved and and said that we would kind of backstop the whole thing mm -hmm. is because of the the constitutional protection zone project which we'd already launched sometime before this mm -hmm. because we really w saw this event as a possibility for reaching out to people and inviting them to participate in this effort to get this a whole area to be a constitutional right. prote protection zone. The good news is 166 people signed up to work on the constitutional protection zone right. project. And we asked them to, to break down their constituencies, and so they did, and so we know how many were from the religious community, how many right. elected leaders, how many attorneys, how many students and young mm -hmm. people, you know, are, we have those categories. We also know the kind of skills that they want to contribute. So mm -hmm. our first meeting, which is like an organizing meeting to get organized into committees and and identify our timeline and goals, mm -hmm. is January seventeenth. Okay. And we're going to be we're going to be doing that at Loudon's Nelson, uh, se yeah, mm -hmm. center, and um, uh, and we're going to be inviting those hundred and sixty six people. Now, if and if other people want to participate mm -hmm. in the actual nit grit organizing of yeah. the whole campaign. Uh, that's the day that we're going to be right. gathering there. It's going to be at 2 o'clock. And people should do this. I mean, yeah. because because right. becoming involved in it, mm -hmm. you start to become much more educated about what it is that's going on. Of course. On. Right. And you get to talk to your neighbors mm -hmm. to try to protect the Constitution. Right. And, and from a tactical point of view, it's important. The first thing we're going to ask the City Council and then the, the Board of Supervisors to do is to pass a resolution that is, is taking one step further along the line than they already have, that the initial resolution that they have, the problem is there's no enforcement in it. Mm -hmm. What we're going to do is ask them to pass a resolution saying that there ought to be an actual ordinance. Mm -hmm. And passed. I will suggest to our viewers that uh, SantaCruzCPZ.org, you have on that website both the city and the county resolution That's that right. they can look at themselves. One of the things that I thought was particularly encouraging for the Hedges event as kind of a, a, of a launching point for me anyway to be involved in constitutional protections going was the pre-event. We had so many uh, of the leaders, the gatekeepers, the policy makers, right. those people there interested right. and ready to mobilize themselves and their networks right. into pushing this forward. Yeah. Uh, just in, and that Before really that. is very encouraging for me. I think Danny uh, really uh, identifies what you need to do, and this makes it a grassroots effort. That's right. Right. Get out when you're talking to people, to people about you know what is the NDAA, how does it threaten your civil liberties, what can we do to protect not only my civil liberties but my neighbor's civil liberties, my community civil liberties, my country's civil liberties for right. that matter. And right. this is particularly important. But uh, say, tell us more about you know that kind of organizing and what what you really hope to accomplish. Well, it's, it's, that. it's first first what we want to do is we want to get. We want to get individual people to right. say, look it, I, I support a resolution like this. Mm -hmm. I support a resolution telling our city council that we want you to pass an ordinance. Right. So that if we can get the, we can get the city council and the, and the board of supervisors first on board agreeing to at least pass a resolution, uh, taking one more step mm -hmm. in this direction. Mm -hmm. And then the ordinance itself, just a short three-page ordinance, right. uh, if passing the ordinance, which actually makes it enforceable. And what the ordinance is going to be doing is eventually saying, look it, if in fact you're a member of an official or you're a law enforcement officer and you get wind of the fact that someone's going to try to enforce it here as a, as a condition of your continued employment. Ah, interesting. There you go. You have to putting, notify putting some city, teeth in it. You yeah. have to notify right. the city council mm -hmm. and you have to notify the board of supervisors. Mm -hmm. And then they're required under the ordinance to immediately take steps yeah. to find the person who may be the target of such a, an right. enforcement effort, yeah. not to let them go free, bring them before a magistrate here yeah. and have a full hearing with probable cause standards mm -hmm. and represented by counsel, everything that they're entitled to. Right. We're not trying to set up a zone where any potential terrorist can come and get, and get totally yeah. protected. Right. What we're doing is setting up a procedure where the constitutional rights are going to be yeah. provided to anybody right. that the federal government wants to target inside yeah. our state. And let me say before you continue, and I'd like you to continue in that vein, uh, people will ask, you know, well, Constitutional Protection Zone, what does that 
that look like? What does it accomplish? How is it enforced? And this is exactly what you're exactly talking what about. Because we can tell people that this is what it's going to do. This That's is right. how it's going to be uh, in effect. That's exactly right. And so it's very, it's very concrete that, that if, if you're a, a, a deputy sheriff, for example, and you get a call, and this is covered in the ordinance, mm -hmm. if you get a call from any federal uh, military official or any federal law enforcement official or any private corporation that's working with them, such as Blackwater mm -hmm. uh, or anybody else, uh, or any other state official that's working with them, and that they're indicating that they're con contemplating coming into the state of California to enforce this, mm -hmm. then what you're required as a condition of your future employment mm -hmm. is to contact our city council, every one of the city council members, not just one or two, but every single one of them immediately by courier if necessary. Wow. Okay, mm -hmm. and the, then the, the ordinance will mandate that, that once they receive that notice, every member of the city council or state board or, or county board of supervisors mm -hmm. has to immediately come to the, to the city council, mm -hmm. has to come there, and as soon as a quorum is available, they have to then move together to take steps to, to get that person in custody, right. a protective custody. Mm -hmm who is being targeted and bring them in front of a magistrate here in our city or in our county mm -hmm. and have that then then put the federal government on notice that if they're intending to make any action taken against this person they're to come before the court and they're to provide whatever the evidence is that they have against that person mm -hmm. and our magistrates will provide all of the constitutional rights to these mm -hmm. people and that otherwise we're going to we're going to ask the governor we're going to ask the governor to move yeah. in and to establish protection for this person mm -hmm. in, in, the, in, the same, in the same way yeah. that they did, for example, with some of the people in the, at the Wounded Knee Occupation right. back in 1973, Dennis Banks. Dennis Banks, who was being sought on a completely unconstitutional set of charges against him, came to California, and Jerry Brown uh, gave him protection here. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do is once we get the city of Santa Cruz on board this, mm -hmm. first with a resolution, right. then with the ordinance, then with the ordinance, and then the county, mm -hmm. then we're going to go to other cities and other counties. We're going to try to get California to become a constitutional protection zone. Absolutely. Uh, so yeah. that we will stand and mm -hmm. so that the, the position that was originally taken mm -hmm. by the state assembly right. in making it a crime for any federal official to come into this state to try to enforce this is going to then be put back into the law. So that's where we're going. That's where we're going. And, and you know, I think it's important that in any successful grassroots movement, there is always a point at which you want to educate people. You want to tell them exactly what this is that they are, we're asking them to support that's and right. how it will benefit and impact their lives. And I think that's uh, the, the real benefit, again, of having a Romero Institute involved, having yourself, you know, a man you know, of your caliber, your national reputation involved with something like this, to say, well, let me see. I'll, I'll take a look at this. You know, does this apply to my life? How is this going to apply to my neighbor, to my community, as I say? And to have the Romero Institute involved uh, is really a, be a be extreme benefit to the organizational aspect of it. Well, w one thing I, w I would like to say, again, I'd like to go back to something I was saying Please. earlier, yeah. and that I think is so important. Uh, it certainly has, it's very important to us in, in um, taking this on and reaching out to other people to work with all of us together, is when you have, we, in our community, we have a lot of libertarian folks. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm aware of that, and they've been, been part of our meetings. Um, that's not the same as what I was talking about earlier, the extreme right wing. Mm -hmm. uh, because libertarian folks, they have, they have very conservative economic views, but they, have very, um, they support this constitution and they su support civil liberties. And um, so they're a, kind of a different mix in terms of their views. What I'm talking about when I say the extreme right is, is an element of people that I, I believe we've got to wake up about what's happening. You know, and, and for us, as people who have worked with constitutional issues for 40 years, mm -hmm. this was, is just too much to take. <laughs> the, this, this NDAA yep. and this right. removal of the most important gift that we have in the, to give the world, mm -hmm. uh, it, which is our, our, the whole concept, the inspired concept of our Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And um, I, to, for, for, for this, when Danny lays out the history of how it became very clear that they, yes, we're going to apply it to Americans, and no, they, they weren't going to say they weren't going to apply it to Chris Hedges and Daniel Ellsberg and Noam Chomsky, this, this is a clear sign that 
that we all have something at stake here yeah. because this is this is like eating away uh, at at our most important foundations in this country. And, and, and so they're, we're, and they're we're, waiting. They're waiting for us to acquiesce to it. Right. Yeah. And, and, they're and waiting for people to just oh well John, it won't ever happen. John, you that lawyer has actually written a book called the National Security Constitution in which he's saying that the acquiescence on the part of the citizenry or the Congress mm -hmm. in the face of these nice. kind of activities can legally be interpreted as part of like a legislative history that authorizes them to go forward right. and do this. Yeah. So that they're banking on the American people not mobilizing. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to cite that to us as to why they can come and arrest your neighbor. Well, you know? it's, it's, it's also, I, this is the time in, for us, I mean, we're just kind of at that time mm -hmm. of saying no. To a t uh, to a fear campaign of around course, terrorism, yeah. because because that element mm -hmm. is using this. Uh, you either do this, or we're going to say you're soft on terrorism. Yeah. We have to stand up and say you're not going to do that to us. Mm -hmm. because we're, you right. know, and then take away the civil and, and liberties I think this under is, it. Yeah. It's an appropriate time for that because uh, in our country now, uh, that's the language. You that's know, the language. police brutality or the things happen in Ferguson. That this stops today. And yeah. that's what you have to understand, that this stops today and today we move forward. But I think right. what people don't often understand is that, personal, that civil liberties is not something that the government gives you. It's a personal thing. That's it's right. something that you own. Right. That's right. And you have to really be uh, to understand and wake up to it before you personalize it and you're willing to do something to protect it. That's and right. I think that's what the that's Constitution right. protects This is, this is, no, this is, is no give. gift from them. No. You know, right. The fact is that people that get into executive positions of power mm -hmm. uh, view the Constitution as an impediment. <laughs> you know, the, the only time they encounter it is when it's being enforced against them. Right. And so that they're constantly trying to figure out how to get around it mm -hmm. and how to vitiate it. And that's the first lesson you learn uh, in, in, of the Constitution right. is that the reason that we put this into writing is because every administration every administration is going to be inclined to try to violate these particular rights. Right. And the, so the, we're not, we're not, it's no favor that they're doing to us. Mm -hmm. These belong to us. And as a sole these condition for us. our granting to you the power right. that we've given to you specific delegated powers right. that we the people have given those to you. You don't have any power. Mm -hmm. You have no legitimate power to be doing things that violate these fundamental rights. You're without power ab initio, as ab they initio. say, from the very beginning, Absolutely. you have yeah. no such power. So when you come for us, mm -hmm. when you come for us mm -hmm. in violation of these rights, you're no more authorized than any other person that might walk off the street to try to arrest us, to take us into custody, to put us in a jail somewhere, not bring us in front mm -hmm. of a magistrate. You are, mm -hmm. in, in our state legislature, the, how the assembly had said mm -hmm. so, you are a criminal. Right. You are a criminal who's coming here to try to engage in a crime against us. We need to mobilize and we need to empower ourselves to treat them like criminals. Yeah. And we want, we've got to get start here in our city and in our county mm -hmm. to do what the state assembly was willing to do, to declare those people to be criminals and to declare to be a criminal anybody who participates with them well, and make it clear. The, the other thing is that, that uh, as someone said in, in the organizing meeting the other day, uh, Tatanka, who has a long history of, of organizing experience Indeed. with, with uh, uh, Cesar Chavez and, uh, and the farm workers, but he, he said, you know, it's important for us to really realize that we're only reaching out to people and asking them to follow the oath that they have taken when they took office. Right. Every, all the people who are elected officials, the, I mean, the police, everybody yeah. is, is, has taken an oath to the Constitution. Mm -hmm. To protect it, and so what we're what CPZ is all about, the Constitutional Protection Zone movement is all about, is saying, okay, well, let's let's stand with that. Yeah. We are going to protect the Constitution. Let's acknowledge that that's our duty. Yeah, let's not that, engage just in platitudes. Right. Say, oh, we, we really wish the Constitution were enforced. Yeah. We think it ought to be enforced. Yeah. Yeah. Then enforce it. Mm -hmm. That's your job. That's your oath to protect and again, the Constitution. Yeah, and again, I think that, that it is a very personal thing, and I think that you really have to make people aware that, that they may come for you. 
you know. And now you have to understand that they're going to come for you. And as you mentioned at the top of the show, Danny, so first they came for the lawyers, you know, and that kind of thing. When you think they're coming from somebody else, yeah. then you depersonalize it. And you don't yeah. get involved. But the grassroots nature of this is to let people yeah. know that these are our rights. It's the, it's it's the famous quote rights. by Reverend Niemuller. Yeah. You know, he was sitting in the prison and he said, you know. In he, Germany. In Germany in, in, 19, in 1937. He said, you know, right out. He said, look at the, these, these statues that were passed. First, they came for the Jews, and I wasn't a Jew. I was a Christian, so mm -hmm. I didn't do anything. Then they, then they came for the communists, and I wasn't a communist, so I didn't do anything. Then they came for the socialists, and I wasn't a socialist, <laughs> so I didn't do anything. And then they came for the labor union people. I wasn't a labor union person. You know? And then they came for the gypsies, and I wasn't a gypsy. You know? But then they came for me. And I turned, and there was nobody left to help There was nobody me. to stand for you. There was yeah. nobody here to help me. Yeah, exactly you know? right. And so what I'm saying is that there is, in fact, a narrow yeah. utilitarian, a self-interested argument mm -hmm. uh, that each and individual person can make for themselves mm -hmm. as to why they should participate in doing this. Yeah. But there has to be also a sense of, of camaraderie for your fellow citizens. Yeah, a much broader concept, you know, of course. You may, yeah. not be, you may not be Chris Hedges, who writes books and you know was a Pulitzer Prize-winning mm -hmm. journalist for the New yeah. York Times, the head of the yeah. New York Times Bureau in the Middle East, who comes before a federal court and the United States Attorney says, yes, I want to reserve the right to, mm -hmm. to sweep you off the street and put you in a military stockade right. and waterboard you, which mm -hmm. we don't consider to be uh, you know, torture. You know, and, and you know, the, the, these, these people are right as we're on the air now, still going on television every day saying what they are doing mm -hmm. is okay. And that what they, what the, the kind of activities they engaged in, the torture that they engaged in, you know, that those were necessary. Yeah. They're trying to rationalize it. So we, we still have not gotten the message through to these no. people. Yeah. Uh, and so that we're at risk. We're at risk by these people. And yes, their rights are no less threatened than Chris Hedges. You know, no, that's right. He may be standing on a stage and talking about uh, defending our civil liberties, but there are civil liberties. That's right. Know, and, 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 they're gonna, civil liberties. and they're going to run again. You know, if they run Jeb Bush, yeah. you know, I mean, how, how many Bushes do you yeah. have to confront right. on this thing? You know, yeah. to see that H.W. Bush uh, was, was behind all of this mm -hmm. stuff, the invasion into the Middle East to secure the oil fields. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, the, these people are getting set to run another administration against us, you know, and that the fact of the matter is we need to make a stand that, that we now realize that it isn't just they that are the problem, right. that Obama is the problem, Hillary Clinton could be the problem. Right. You know, we've got, to get, we've got to stand up for ourselves and say we don't care whether it's a Republican or Democratic administration. Right. We're mad as hell. And we're not going to take this and on anymore. That, yeah, and on that note, uh, we, we have about 30 seconds or so. It's well, been wonderful having you here. You have a final comment for us, I Sarah, do. as we go out? There's a quote by, by uh, Benjamin Franklin that we, we, we had various quotes at, at the Chris Hedges event that were up so everyone could see them. And, and he said, people who will sacrifice liberty for security don't deserve either yeah, very and will not book. have yeah. either. Yeah. Yeah, and I right. think that's, that's yeah. where we're at. Well, um, people can go to the Santa Cruz CPZ.org website. They can go to the Romero Institute website, uh, Romero Institute.org. Uh, Danny Sheehan, Sarah Nelson, thank you so much for being here. It has been a pleasure sure. working with you in the recent past, and I look forward to working with you more in the future. Let's bring a Constitution Protection Zone to Santa Cruz, both in the city and the county. So thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching this edition of Human Rights Here Now, and thanks to our producer, uh, Matilda Rand, all the folks behind the cameras in the engineering room. Uh, this Some is how CTV works. This is what Pentagon. makes it work. We're all Some volunteers. So thank you for tuning in, and we'll see Some you next time on Human Rights Here Now. The tuple at the bottom. Some say the tuple's the anatomy. Some say the tuple's in the head. Some say the tuple's the psychology. Where's the tuple at the bottom? Trouble, trouble, where's the trouble?